Behavioral economics is a relative new concept. It is that branch of economics which study the human behavior in order to come up with accurate economic predictions. However, to get the public, especially the traditional economic theory believers, to embrace this idea, the authors had to overcome several hurdles which are narrated each one in this book. Supposedly Irrelevant Factors The author's interest in behavioral economics began when his students reacted negatively to their exam results. Apparently, students were happier to get 96 out of 137, which is 70%, than to get 72 out of 100. This opened his eyes to the fact that students felt more accomplished when their average score was in the 90s instead of one in the 70s, although the latter was, in fact, higher. However, for an economist, this behavior was inconsistent with the economic theory. According to these theories, human behavior results from choices based on rational expectations. To build this theory, economists created a fictional species called Homo economicus, also known as econs, who replaced human beings in their models. Unfortunately, humans do many misbehaving, leading economists to make bad predictions. From this, the author emphasizes the need to stop assuming that models based on imagery Econs are accurate depictions of human behavior. Instead, he encourages economists to pay attention to supposedly irrelevant factors, the accurate characterization of human behavior. Thus, behavioral economics was born. The author notes that behavioral economics is still economics. The difference lies in the injection of well-researched psychology and other social sciences in order to come up with an accurate economic model. To simplify, behavioral economics adds humans to economic theories in order to improve predictions. Although a relatively new concept, this branch of economics is rapidly growing. In fact, practitioners from all over the world are beginning to recognize behavioral economics as a helpful policy-making tool. This book aims to share the story of how behavioral economics came to be. The author hopes that this will help readers understand and appreciate this branch of economics on a deeper level. The Endowment Effect While he was still a graduate student at the University of Rochester in New York, the author had already begun to question the economic theory. Nonetheless, he was not confident about his view because he felt like he had also had a flawed understanding of the subject matter. He was just a student after all. His curiosity peaked when he was already working on his thesis, which revolves around the value of life. During the course of his data gathering, he asked his sample group hypothetical questions which would determine two things. A person's willingness to pay, which asks a person how much he is willing to pay to reduce the probability of dying next year, or a person's willingness to accept, which asks a person how much money he would demand to increase his risk of dying. Economists who strongly adhere to the economic theory would predict that the answer to these two questions would be almost identical. The study, however, revealed the opposite. On average, respondents were willing to pay an amount not more than $2,000 for the first question, while they would not accept an amount less than $500,000 for the second question. This revelation baffled economists. Nonetheless, the author has an explanation to this behavior. He calls it the endowment effect, that what you have is part of your endowment and that people tend to put more value on the things already in their endowment. However, not everyone, economists especially, understands the endowment effect. To illustrate the endowment effect clearly and how differently economists see it from consumers, the author shares the story of an economist and a divinity school student. Both of them were given tickets to watch a much-awaited basketball game. Both of them were big basketball fans, and both of them knew exactly what to do with the tickets. The economist sold the ticket for hundreds of dollars, which he used to help finance his graduate studies. On the other hand, the divinity student saw the ticket as something that would bring him enjoyment, so he decided to watch the game. In the end, the economist and divinity student both made use of the ticket, but thought that the other's decision was silly. From that situation, the author knew that the endowment effect was a real phenomenon. Now the question is, what does he do with it? The List During searching for inspiration on what his paper would be about, the author tried to determine the factors that ran counter to the standard economic theory. With that in mind, he began to list down examples of how his friends behaved and how they were inconsistent with the economic theory. Among his observations were the following. Jeffrey scored free tickets to a professional basketball game. However, on the day of the game, there was a big snowstorm. 
Jeffrey decided not to go, but he remarked that if he had paid for the tickets, he would have braved the storm. This behavior ran counter to the economic theory because economists believe that people tend to ignore the money that has already been spent. Thus, the price paid for the tickets should not affect his choice of watching the game. Another example is Stanley, who regularly mows the lawn despite suffering from hay fever right after doing so. He does not like the idea of paying people $10 to mow the lawn for him. When asked if he was willing to mow his neighbor's lawn for double the price, Stanley vehemently refused. This runs counter to the economic theory because there is a belief that buying and selling prices are the same. The third example is Linnea, who was shopping for a clock radio and was able to find one for $45. Upon checkout, the clerk informed her that the same item was being sold for $35 at another branch, which was 10 minutes away. On a separate trip, she was able to pay for a TV set worth $495. The clerk informed her that the same item was being sold for $485 at a branch located 10 minutes away. Both offers involved a $10 discount, but Linnea reacted differently. This behavior is inconsistent because economists believe that people value time equally, whether it means saving up for a small or large purchase. The fourth example is Lee, who received an expensive cashmere sweater from his wife as a gift. He had seen the sweater before, but he did not buy it because he felt like it was way too much. Note that Lee and his wife pull all their money but he was nevertheless excited over the gift. Thus, he felt that it was okay to spend money from the family's resources because his wife made the decision. Finally, the author recalls the time his friends came over for dinner. He brought out a large bowl of nuts for them to snack on while waiting for their food to be cooked. The author removed the bowl and hid it in the kitchen so that there would still be enough room for dinner. Contrary to what economists believe, that people prefer having more choices They actually were happy with having the nuts kept in the kitchen. This list helped the author realize that humans, because of our limited time and brain power, use heuristics to help them make judgments. This simply means that people follow simple rules of thumb based on instances they experienced. In effect, heuristics caused them to make what the author refers to as predictable errors, and these predictable errors and biases form the foundation for the author's work. Value Theory In the course of his research, the author came across the work of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, which he believed was highly relevant to his paper. It was called the value theory, which was eventually renamed to the prospect theory. What caught his interest was the fact that this theory involved two principles, an organizing principle and a simple graph. The first principle of the theory revolves around the organizing principle. This principle states that there exist two different kinds of theories, the normative and the descriptive theories. According to the traditional economic idea, a single theory of human behavior can be both normative and descriptive. However, Kahneman and Tversky's prospect theory sought to break that concept. In order to prove this point, the author relates it to Daniel Bernoulli's diminishing sensitivity principle. According to Bernoulli, people's happiness increases as they get wealthier, but as their wealth grows, it impacts also decreases. To illustrate, a normal salaryman who receives $100,000 would find it life-changing, while the opposite is true to billionaires. With this in mind, the prospect theory revolved around observing actual human behavior, thus resulting in accurate predictions of people's choice. Unfortunately, economists did not embrace this idea, making it difficult. The second principle of the theory involves a stunning graph. According to the author, this graph reflects the value function. The graph came to be when Kahneman and Tversky focused on changes in wealth as opposed to the levels of wealth normally used in traditional economic models. According to these two theorists, we must focus on changes because human beings experience life through changes. The author illustrates this by making us imagine being in an air-conditioned room which maintains a typical room temperature. When we leave, we immediately notice the difference in the temperature. Nevertheless, Once we have adapted to the new temperature, our tendency is to ignore it. From this, the author was able to infer that the changes we experience affect what we feel and think, thereby also affecting the choices we make. Additionally, the graph also reflects that the loss function is steeper than the gain function. This means that when they incur losses, people feel hurt twice as much as they feel good when they incur gains, even when the amount of losses and gains are equal. 
This runs counter to the traditional idea that an equal amount of loss or gain would produce the feeling of hurt or happiness to the same extent. To conclude this chapter, the author shares that this theory helped him realize the following, that people experience life in terms of changes, that people experience diminishing sensitivity to both gains and losses, and that loss hurt more than equally sized gains felt good. Moreover, unknown to the author at that time, these ideas and theories will be with him for the rest of his career. California Dreaming In 1977, the author finally had the chance to meet his idols, Kahneman and Tversky. From their meetings, he discovered that these two theorists worked on the prospect theory through asking hypothetical questions. This was big news to the author because, at that time, economists did not believe in getting accurate answers from hypothetical questions. Nonetheless, Kahneman and Tversky felt that they had no other choice. Among the key concepts in their theory states that people react differently to losses than they do to gains. To prove this, they had to go all out on an experiment. Unfortunately, getting the permission to conduct the experiment was a much bigger challenge. Thus, Kahneman and Tversky decided that asking hypothetical questions would be the simpler alternative. They believed that this method would work because they assumed that their subjects would be making reasonable, accurate choices, the choices that they would actually make if they were actually confronted with that situation. Moreover, if these choices were inconsistent with the traditional economic theories, then it would create a reasonable doubt as to the accuracy of the traditional theories. Fortunately, the prospect theory gained acceptance because it paved the way to explain how people behave in a myriad of situations. To the author, the success of the prospect theory made him realize that he could ask people hypothetical questions and actually get reasonable answers. This realization finally inspired the author to take the first step and do something about the examples on his list, and aside from asking questions, he still wanted to run experiments and study how people behave in their natural habitats. However, how to do it was still beyond him. The Gauntlet The pieces of his behavioral economics puzzle were slowly falling into place. The author, however, recognizes that there is another problem he has to hurdle, skeptic economist. To provide answers to these traditional thinkers, the author prepared a list of reasons why economists ignore human behaviors. He finally calls this list as the gauntlet. These are the notable criticisms to his work. Economists assume that people behave as if They can solve a problem even when they are actually incapable of doing so. Unfortunately, people do not think like experts every time they are faced with problems. In fact, subjects of a survey conducted by Kahneman and Tversky were not making irrational choices, that is, choices based on the traditional economic model. At that time, however, economists were not easily swayed by survey evidence alone. Economists believe that people are driven by incentives in solving their problems. They believe that when something big is at stake, people tend to think harder and do everything necessary to solve the problem. Relatedly, this means that people consistently know what they like. Thus, if they like choice A as against choice B, they will always choose choice A over choice B. However, a study conducted by Sarah Lichtenstein and Paul Slavik suggests that people can be induced to choose both choices. This means that people do not have well-defined preferences because external factors can make them change their minds. Economists can also argue that, in the real world, people learn from the mishaps they experienced throughout the years. Although the author finds this reasonable, he does not believe that this argument applies to a variety of situations. He notes that the downside to belief is that it assumes that we live in a world where we relive each day repeatedly. The author posits that in life, we do small tasks on a regular basis, and these are the tasks which we continuously have opportunities to learn from. However, with respect to other activities or choices, like buying a home or choosing a job, we do not get enough opportunities to learn. Thus, this learning theory cannot always accurately portray human behavior. Finally, the last counterargument is what the author calls as the invisible handshake. The author shares that this argument involves a theory that markets affect how people behave, and he observed that every time economists use this argument, they would passionately wave their hands in the air, because there was no logical way to explain how markets can cause people to become rational economic agents. In order to succeed in proving the importance of behavioral economics, 
the author has to find answers for skeptics. His journey towards finding these answers will be narrated in the succeeding chapters. Bargains and Ripoffs The second part of this book talks about mental accounting, which is how the author describes the way people think about money. To understand how mental accounting works, we must first learn how opportunity costs affect economic decisions. Opportunity costs refer to the other activities that you might have done with the time you have spent doing another activity. To illustrate, suppose you have a ticket worth $1,000 for a basketball game. The opportunity cost is not the value of the ticket per se, but the fact that you are going to the game because you believe that it is the best way to spend $1,000. If you feel that watching 100 movies worth $10 would be a better way to spend it, then that may be your opportunity cost. Thus, when a person makes decisions through the lens of opportunity cost, he makes sure that both his time and money will be well spent. This is an ideal decision-making tactic, unfortunately, Only econs think that way. Through the course of his work, the author was able to come up with a formulation that explains why econs and humans make decisions differently. He suggests that there are two kinds of utility, acquisition and transaction. Acquisition utility refers to the surplus derived after we measure the utility of the object gained minus its opportunity cost. This is how econs think. They believe that a purchase will only produce acquisition utility if a specific consumer values the object more than the marketplace. To illustrate this concept, the author shares how a typical econ would be happier to buy a smaller quilt, which perfectly fits his bed instead of a bigger one that will hang from the sides even if the bigger one is priced the same as the smaller one. On the other hand, transaction utility refers to the perceived quality of the deal and this is what humans consider when making a purchase. The author defines this as the difference between the reference price and the actual price paid and can be either negative or positive. To illustrate, a person who buys a bottle of water from a store selling it at triple the normal price would consider it as a ripoff or a negative transaction utility. Alternatively, an item sold at a price cheaper than what it normally costs would be considered a bargain or a positive transaction utility. From this, we can see that humans can be drawn to positive transaction utility. Good deals often lure us into making purchases just because the deal is too good to pass up, even when we do not really need the item. According to the author, the thrill we get from transaction utility is what sellers use to create the illusion of a great deal. Thus, it is easy to see why transaction utility and not the econ's acquisition utility should be the basis for determining and understanding consumer behavior. Sunk cost. Another important mental accounting concept we should understand is sunk cost. The author shares that economists often advise people to ignore sunk costs or the money spent which can no longer be retrieved. However, for us human beings, this can be tough to take. The author explains that when we spend money on something that we do not use, we tend to acknowledge that as a loss. Conversely, when we use something that we have paid for, we feel good about that transaction. With this in mind, the author decided to conduct another survey between economists and non-economists. He gave respondents two hypothetical situations. In the first, he gave them a situation where they acquired a bottle of Bordeaux for $20. At present, the wine now sells for $75 per bottle. He asked respondents how much they felt it cost if they decided to drink the bottle. 30% of the respondents believed that it did not cost them anything because they had already paid for it. 25%, on the other hand, believed that they were able to save $55 because they bought the bottle at a cheaper amount. Nevertheless, according to the economic theory, the correct answer should be $75 because the opportunity cost of drinking the wine is its current selling price. True enough, 20% of the respondents, all economists, chose this answer. In the second situation, the author asked the respondents how they would feel if they had dropped and broken the bottle. Surprisingly, the majority of respondents agree that dropping the bottle cost them $75. From this survey, we can see how people truly feel about cost. Our outlook on the matter varies depending on whether we have made use of it or not. Thus, understanding how sunken costs affect human behavior is an important factor in mental accounting and behavioral economics. Buckets and Budgets 
One of the more important aspects of mental accounting that we must understand is the concept of budgets. Of course, we are all too familiar with budgets. Often our budgets are divided into several categories, food, utilities, rent, and so on. Once we have these categories delineated, we stick to the amount associated with them and savings in one category remains there. However, according to the author, budgets violate another principle of economics because economists believe that money is fungible or something that has no restrictions on what it can be spent. To help us understand why budgets run counter to the economic theory, the author provides us with an illustration based on an actual study. Suppose that the price of regular gasoline fell from $4 per gallon to only $2 per gallon. An econ would think that since the price dropped by 50%, he can take more road trips and that he could use the money saved on other matters that would help maximize utility. Similarly, a human would think that this price reduction would entitle him to more road trips. Nevertheless, instead of using the money for other matters, he would think of buying premium gasoline instead of the regular kind because it was well within his gasoline budget to do so. Nevertheless, setting up a budget is not a silly thing to do. In fact, budgets are not only used by individuals and families, organizations rely on them to avoid financial problems. The secret lies in knowing how to maximize the utilization of money to ensure economic growth. Otherwise, we will only end up putting our money inside a leaky bucket. At the Poker Table The final aspect of mental accounting occurred to the author in the most peculiar situation. By this time, the author was all too familiar with Kahneman and Tversky's prospect theory. However, during a poker game with his colleagues, he noticed that one aspect of the prospect theory had an incomplete explanation. According to the theory, people would rather gamble $200 for a 50% chance of breaking even instead of a sure loss of $100. However, through the course of the poker game, he noticed that the players who were not doing well in the game tended to make small bets that afforded them a slim chance for a big win. They did not seem to favor big bets, which offered a higher probability of gain because it also increased their risk of experiencing loss. He also observed that players who were winning did not treat the money as real money, so they had the propensity to make bigger bets. Again, these actions violate the rule that money is fungible, which led the author to conduct another study. The study involved three situations. One, you have just won $30. 70% of respondents chose to have a 50% chance to gain or lose $9, while the remaining 30% opted for no further gain or loss. Two, you have just lost $30. 60% opted for no further gain or loss, while 40% chose to have a 50% chance to gain or lose $9. Three, you have just lost $30. 60% of respondents prefer to have a 33% chance to gain $30 and a 67% chance to gain nothing, while 40% opted for a short $10. The author interpreted the results of the first problem as reflective of what he calls as the house money effect. This term is derived from the common casino's winner behavior, where they tend to gamble with the house's money, their winnings. Thus, although the normal tendency is to be risk-averse for gains, if the money is derived from previous winnings, then they are more likely to take on the gamble. On the other hand, the second and third problems reflect what the author calls as the break-even effect. This means that they would choose to gamble a little bit if it entails them a chance at breaking even. The author shares that once we recognize these two effects, we can easily spot and use them to our advantage. In fact, Recognizing the house money effect can help a person understand and predict financial bubbles. On the other hand, trying to break even is a common behavior among professional investors. Willpower? No problem. Among the examples on the list, the item that seemed different from the rest was the cashew incident. To an economist, having more options should make a person happier. But the opposite was true with the author and his friends. This reflects self-control, and the author seeks to help us understand this phenomenon in this chapter. Economic theories dictate what we want is reflected by the choices we make, thereby rendering self-control problems in existence. However, human behavior says otherwise, and the author is driven to prove it. The author shares works and studies done by prominent economists Adam Smith, Irving Fisher, and Paul Samuelson, hinted at the possible existence of self-control problems. 
According to their research, although they did not dwell much on the topic, people tend to make choices about the timing of consumption. They referred to this as the intertemporal choice. The concept of intertemporal choice finds relevance in the author's work because it also stresses willpower and the willpower that helps us overcome a form of economic myopia. To elaborate on this myopia idea, Samuelson came up with the discounted utility theory. According to this theory, consumption is worth more to us now than it will be later. Additionally, humans are said to discount future consumption at some rate. Nevertheless, if these rates vary over time, then people may also change their minds, and this can lead to inconsistent behavior. Unfortunately, the intertemporal choice is often dismissed by economists as an abstract concept. The author also shares that intertemporal choice plays an important role in macroeconomics. This is reflected by the fact that a family's spending habit is affected by how much it earns. With all these in mind, the author lays strong emphasis on the need to study actual humans instead of the ideal econs. That is what the author did, which shall be narrated in the next chapter. The Planner and the Doer As previously discussed, there is a need to create an economic model based on real humans so economists could make accurate predictions. From the idea that self-control results from an internal conflict, a disagreement between two sides, the author was able to conceptualize a two-self model. This model reflects that each individual has two selves, the planner, who is focused on the future, and the doer, who lives in the present. To help us imagine how these two selves function, the author would like us to imagine a principal-agent relationship. In an interpersonal sense, the doers are the agents who live and work on a daily basis. On the other hand, the planner is the principal who is responsible for overseeing the doer and make sure that the latter acts are in accordance with his long-term goals. Although their powers may be limited, principals still exercise a certain amount of control over the doers, the ability to influence the doer's decisions, or the ability to impose rules that can limit the doer's opinions. With this in mind, it can be easy to see why this model would be the most useful way to depict and try to solve self-control problems. Nonetheless, the author recognizes that it may only show some aspects of human behavior and not an accurate depiction of human behavior in its entirety. He believes, however, that we have the capacity to recognize self-control problems, and when we see these problems, we must let the planner firmly set his foot down to stop the doer from being tempted to go off track. Misbehaving in the Real World In this chapter, the author shares the story of two businesses. One is a small family-owned resort, while one is a colossal car manufacturing company. Both of these establishments would serve as an illustration in order for us to understand what it is like to be misbehaving in the real world. Greek Peak The first business is called Greek Peak, a family-owned ski resort near Ithaca. At the time the author met the resort's marketing director, Michael Cobb, the business was already suffering from serious financial difficulties. Back then, it seemed apparent to the author that if Greek Peak wanted to remain in business, it needed to increase prices. However, the problem with increasing ticket prices is that it would make them almost as par with bigger and well-known ski resorts, resorts with more chairlifts and better terrain. How could they possibly raise revenue without driving away their price-sensitive market? Through behavioral economics, the author was able to suggest a revenue model where ticket prices would gradually rise over a period of years. This would avoid the backlash that could be caused by any sudden price increase. In addition, to justify the additional charge, he encouraged the management to improve the overall ski experience at the resort. However, revenue from these ticket sales was not enough. They had to come up with another way to boost revenue without offending their market. For college students, they were able to come up with the six-pack promo, where the resort would offer six weekend lift tickets at a discounted price if these tickets were bought before a specific date. To students, this seemed like a good deal, and the fact that it was called a six-pack made it more attractive. They also came up with the 10-pack, a deal which included five weekend and five weekday tickets and was sold at 40% off the retail price. This offer was only available for locals and became wildly popular. The author attributes the 10-pack popularity to two factors. The first is that consumers recognize that getting 10% off the retail price is a great deal thereby reflecting transaction utility. 
The second factor lies in the fact that the advanced purchase was viewed more as an investment, thereby shifting the buyer's opinion from a purchase to a decision to go skiing. As the years went by, tin packs were still being sold and Greek Peak had risen out of debt. True enough, the use of behavioral economics in its ticket pricing model had helped the resort build a solid revenue. General Motors The second business is the American automotive manufacturer General Motors. The author shares that since new car models were introduced during the fall of each year, consumers would find themselves hesitating to buy last year's model. As a result, manufacturers would have many unsold cars in their inventory. To deal with this problem, manufacturers came up with deals in order to boost their sales. Ford and Chrysler offered discounted auto loans with an interest rate of 10%, so someone at GM thought it would be a great idea to induce clients with an interest rate of just 2.9. True enough, GM sales shot up as a result. However, the author was not sure if that solution would work on a long-term basis. He approached a colleague who was consulting for GM, who in turn landed him a meeting with the GM's top executives. The author proposed two suggestions. The first was to determine why the offer worked so well. The second was to make a plan for the future because he predicts that competitors would do the same. However, this proposal was ultimately rejected by the management. Unfortunately, GM's overconfidence and reluctance to test and evaluate their promotions took a turn for the worse. Summer after summer, its plan to eliminate excessive inventory failed, eventually leading to their downfall. At this point, it was clear to the author that the people behind Tiny Greek Peak were more analytical about the deals they offer. What seems fair? Between 1984 and 1985, the author finally had the chance to work with one of his idols, Danny Kahneman. In fact, he considers this year as one of the most productive years of his life. It all began when Danny and Jack Kinnich invited him to work on a project which aims to identify what seems to be fair among ordinary citizens. They conducted their study through proposing hypothetical situations that respondents identified as either acceptable or unfair. Through the course of their study, they discovered that people are angered when companies abuse instances of high demand by overpricing the item or service. Yet, a slight change in the situation reveals that overpricing is tolerable if its proceeds would go to charity. Another change in the situation, however, led to another conclusion, that even if proceeds would go to charity, people would be angered if what is being sold is medicine because everyone believes that they are entitled to health care. From all this, the author was able to infer that our perceptions of fairness are related to the endowment effect. Their research revealed that both buyers and sellers felt entitled to the terms of the sell, and that both would work towards working on a deal which they would perceive as fair. Again, this is another point in favor of behavioral economics. Understanding how this concept works can help firms and corporations in raising their prices without creating the impression of being a ripoff. Conversely, this can help them come up with promotions and reasonable deals that can attract more customers. Fairness Games While working on their fairness project described in the previous chapter, another question popped up. If a firm were being unfair, would people be willing to punish the firm? In order to come up with an answer, Danny came up with his own version of the fairness game. The first part of the game will have students share $20 with another student. They were made to choose between dividing the amount equally or one gets 18 while the other only gets $2. In the second part of the game, students were asked whom they would most likely share their money with, the student who divided the money equally or the student who kept the $18. This game revealed that 81% of the students would not think twice about sharing what they have with the fair person. This outcome was surprising for Danny, Jack, and the author. Again, these results ran counter to an aspect of the economic theory because in their models, econs are presumed to be selfish. However, in reality, people are willing to spend part of their money to teach unfair people a lesson. And it is this willingness to punish that maintains discipline and cooperation among human beings. Thus, the fairness games prove to be a convenient way to have a better understanding of human behavior. Mugs In Chapter 16, the author elaborates on the endowment effect. He shares that experiments on this subject revealed that people tend to value what they already have because of loss aversion. 
The author illustrates this effect through one of their experiments involving mugs worth $6 and pins worth $3.98. In their experiment, a coffee mug was placed in front of the students. Those who got a mug were its owners and were potential sellers, all those who did not get the mug were buyers. As it turns out, the students who received the mugs became reluctant to sell them. Danny and the author repeated the experiment with a twist. This time, students who did not receive mugs will get a pin, making all of them buyers and sellers. Nonetheless, the results were the same. Students who received mugs were still reluctant to sell them. The author explains that the student's reluctance to sell reflects the endowment effect, and as the experiment revealed, the endowment effect can occur almost instantly. This instant endowment effect theory was revealed when students had the mug for only a few minutes before the trading started but they were already attached to it because they owned it. This experiment also led the author to discover inertia in an economic setting. Recall that in physics, the law of inertia states that an object stays at rest unless acted upon by an external force. The same is true in an economic setting that a person sticks with what he has unless there is a good reason to switch, a behavior otherwise referred to as status quo bias. To conclude, the author shares that the factors that ultimately inhibit change boils down to loss aversion and status quo bias. Nonetheless, the initial reluctance caused by these factors may be lessened with the help of inertia. More on this will be discussed in later chapters. The debate begins. In October 1985, psychologist Robin Hogarth and economist Mel Reeder organized a conference where experts on both fields tried to sort reasons to take psychology and behavior economics seriously. Of course, Danny and Amos were among the key speakers for the behavior team, along with Herb Simon, Kenneth Arrow, Bob Schiller, Richard Zeckhauser, and the author himself. The other side is composed of rationalists Robert Lucas and Merton Miller. During the conference, Amos pointed out the violations in economic principles while Danny presented the results of his fairness project. The author also shared the following points made by his teammates. According to Arrow, rationality is neither necessary nor sufficient in order to come up with a good economic theory. He points out that established behavioral theories like habits cannot be considered as consistent with rationality. Thus, he encourages economists to recognize that there are alternatives to rationality that can lead to accurate predictions. With respect to his argument that rationality is insufficient on its own, Arrow posits that economists limit themselves to making theories based on the same utility function. However, as pointed out in various studies, humans do not act and behave like econs, nor are we bound by identical utility functions. Miller, on the other hand, presented his view by discussing both rational and behavioral aspects. He partially agrees with rationalists, when he said that the traditional model for financial markets was still being used. However, this model cannot be accurate for various situations. Thus, he emphasized the need to observe real human behavior if the goal is to create accurate models. Finally, Schiller reiterated that changes in the paradigm could only occur if a significant number of anomalies would take place, but instead of insisting on an abandonment of the rational models, he openly discussed that it was more of an enhancement of these models. He believes that we would be able to share models that are more realistic with its students if behavioral economics would be embraced. Anomalies According to Thomas Kuhn, and as previously discussed by Bob Schiller in the previous chapter, Paradigms change only when a large number of anomalies remain unexplained by said paradigm. However, such change may only be justified by facts and a significant number of instances. The author was well aware of these anomalies, and he needed a medium by which to share them with skeptic economists. Fortunately, he was given a chance to do so in 1987. During this year, he was offered to write a regular column for the Journal of Economic Perspective. In his column, he decided to write about each anomaly that he encountered, backed by the data he culled from research. His ultimate goal in accepting the writing job was to discuss a variety of anomalies to create an awareness with the public. This went on for a span of four years and with 14 columns. The author himself decided to take a short break from writing. When he returned, he only wrote about these anomalies on an occasional basis. In 2006, his final piece was published. 
Andre Schleifer, the journal's editor at that time, officially declared that the column's purpose had finally been served. Forming a Team After writing about the anomalies in the basic economic theory, the author was now determined to establish a new field. He recognizes, however, that he cannot do it alone. Moreover, with that, he decided to create his team. By that time, he was already working with George Lauenstein, Bob Schiller, and 20-year-old prodigy Colin Kammerer. Although all of these were experts in the field, he knew he needed more researchers to conduct his studies. He needed someone who would contribute resources on the matter, and fortunately, he met Eric Wanner. The author described Eric as a psychologist by training, but an economist by predilection. Thanks to Eric's charm, the author was able to invite economists and psychologists to work together on behavioral economics. During the course of their meetings, they agreed to conduct intensive training programs for graduate students. This served as a great strategy, not only because it would spark interest among young scholars, but also because schools did not offer a course on behavioral economics. These camps proved to be successful. In the latter years, the camp became self-generating, meaning the students who once attended these camps were now taking over the organization of the camp. They have become faculty members who were willing to educate new scholars on the matter. The summer camp had become a yearly event for young scholars. In fact, the camp has produced over 300 graduates in a span of 10 years, most of them even holding positions at top universities. Without the help of Eric Wanner, none of this would have happened. Narrow Framing on the Upper East Side The author and his team eventually set up an office on the Upper East Side of New York City, where most of their brainstorming took place. During this time, he and Colin had an idea which involved the following questions. When are economic events or transactions combined? When are economic events or transactions treated separately? The author referred to their idea as narrow framing. He shares that according to this idea, a person's ability to decide is driven by two biases, bold forecasts and timid choices. Bold forecasts, on the other hand, was further categorized between the inside view and the outside view. The inside view is our opinion on the matter without taking note of external factors, thus leading to inaccurate predictions. Aside from the biases stated above, the author also notes that there is an anomaly associated with narrow framing, which he refers to as the equity premium puzzle. In economic parlance, equity premium is the difference between stocks and risk-free assets in terms of returns. However, the author notes that some investors earn more than others do. This was a mystery to him. He wondered if it had something to do with the choice of stocks or the period of holding time. This led him to run a series of tests on the matter with a result highlighting how narrow framing can affect how we make our decisions. His study reveals that people who looked at their portfolios less often were more willing to take the risk. When a person looks at his returns frequently, he suffers from myopic loss aversion, so he tried to play it safe. Thus, he fails to see the long-term benefits of investing his money. To conclude, every time the author is asked for investment advice, he would give it a general answer of buying a diversified portfolio which is tilted towards stocks. More importantly, he advises clients to avoid reading or watching the financial news. The Beauty Contest The sixth part of this book deals with how behavioral economics can affect financial markets. Economists theorize that markets shift based on people's behavior, but smart people tend to trade against them, thereby creating balance in market prices. This idea was often referred to as the Efficient Market Hypothesis, or EMH. According to the author, EMH has two components, the first of which is the price is right component. According to this component, stocks are priced based on their intrinsic value, thereby imputing pricing to rationality. On the other hand, the second component states that stocks are priced because there is no way to beat the market, and it is this latter component dominated previous market theories. However, the author shares these emotions play a big part in one's decision-making, even when it comes to their investments. He cites the work of John Maynard Keynes, who likened picking the best stocks to a beauty contest. According to Keynes, investments are similar to newspaper beauty contests where competitors have to pick out the prettiest faces from hundreds of photographs. In these contests, the prize would be awarded to the competitor whose choice corresponds to the average preference of others. 
With this in mind, the competitor disregards his own preferences and goes on to think of which will catch the attention of his competitors, not realizing that all of them are thinking the same thing. Thus, the average opinion is actually based on another opinion of what average opinion would be. For the author, Keene's beauty contest analogy is an accurate description of how financial markets work. From this, we can see that money managers do not pick stocks based on their own preferences, but based off an opinion of what others think is the best. When their opinions on the matter are in harmony, then market prices will surely reflect it. Does the stock market overreact? Although it was clear to the author that human behavior also affects financial markets, he recognizes that finance was not his forte. To understand how financial markets work on a deeper level, he had to work with experts on the subject, one of which was a former student, Werner Den Bont. Werner became interested in studying the overreaction in markets. When Werner explained his idea to the author, he was convinced that there was indeed an overconfidence among investors which can cause high trading volumes. The problem lies in proving this occurrence. To drive their point, Werner and the author based their plan on Kahneman and Tversky's finding, which states that people tend to make extreme forecasts based on flimsy data. The experiment was conducted on a group of students who were made to predict the grade point average of another group of students based on two factors, the decile of the student's GPA and the decile score for the student's sense of humor. Rationality would predict that the student's sense of humor would not affect his GPA at all. However, the results were different because the students predicted that the GPA of those who had a great sense of humor was the same as the GPA of those who were, in fact, had high GPAs. Thus, this characterized that students tend to overreact to information. In a financial setting, the author shares that the same overreaction may happen if investors are fed with information regarding the performance of certain stocks. In other words, if a stock overly performs, then it is caused by optimistic forecast. Conversely, if stocks seem to have sunk, then it has become a prediction of low returns. Thus, even if one stock seems like a loser at one point, but was predicted to have high returns in the future, then it can outperform the market and other seemingly winner stocks in the long run. True enough, the study they conducted reinforced their idea. In fact, it seems convincing enough that their research was published in a group by the Journal of Finance in 1985. The Reaction to Overreaction Although studies confirm the fact that overreactions occur in the market, rational thinkers still claim that this behavior still falls within the efficient market hypothesis. They claim that it is not a violation of EMH, particularly of the second component, which states that it is impossible to beat the market because something cannot be defeated if you have to take a risk. According to the author, this can be answered if we had a way to measure risk. The rational view was that risk can be rewarded, but only if a return can be correlated with other stocks in the market. To illustrate, if your portfolio is entirely composed of stocks which go up and down together, then your portfolio is at great risk. They believe that the best way to invest is to make sure that your portfolio has stocks that tend to cancel out negatives in order to have safe returns. However, his research yielded the opposite results. He observed that in a span of three years, portfolios that were seen as risky performed better than portfolios on the safe side. To him, these data confirm anomalies with the rationalist theory, which endangers their EMH. Nonetheless, he recognized that there's still a way to save the EMH if further studies would reveal that, indeed, the loser portfolio was riskier. Until then, he strongly believes in the strength of his findings. The price is not right. Another interesting aspect of the author's study regarding financial markets revolved around how stocks are priced. This causes attention when a paper published by Schiller presented that stock prices move too much. However, at that time, Schiller wrote the paper in economic and not psychological terms. Schiller conducted his work based on historical data, which he plotted to create accurate graphs of how markets were performing in the past. This led him to predict possible occurrences based on the price of stocks. In fact, Schiller warned against a possible housing bubble that in fact occurred in the 2000s. However, some graphs reveal that not all forecasts were accurate. Instead of taking it as a letdown, 
The author shares that the changes in prices reflect some sort of predictive value, albeit not as accurate. If this happens, then prices must be viewed vis-a-vis their historical values. And the farther they wander away, more red flags must be raised. Thus, although the price is not accurately right in its predictions, it can still be used for reference purposes. The chapter cannot be considered a fatal blow to the efficient market hypothesis. Rationalists were not convinced. This led the author to disprove a law which is found at the heart of EMH, the law of one price. This law states that in an efficient market, the same asset cannot be simultaneously sold at two different prices. The author states that although this law seemed ideal, it was easy to break. Particularly, a closed-in fund is among such suspects. As against open-in funds, these closed-in funds seek to raise an initial amount of money and depositors thereto are not allowed to withdraw therefrom. If EMH were to be applied to this fund, economists would predict that the fund's prices would be equal to the net asset value, NAV. However, when tested against market data, it was revealed that the market price for closed-in funds varied from the NAV. The author shares that the fund values were not always sold at discounts because there were also instances when they were sold at premiums. This led to hypothesize that discounts vary over time and can eventually affect its selling price. To obtain more answers to this hypothesis, the authors looked into data based on real investors. After enough data gathering, he was able to discover that average discount on closed-in funds was connected with returns between small and large company stocks. Moreover, the greater the discount, the larger the difference in the returns would be. The discovery of this led to a controversial clash with Merton Miller, Although he did not know what caused Miller to become angry, he was thankful because the fight gave his paper the attention it deserves. Fruit Flies, Icebergs, and Negative Stock Prices While doing his research work at the University of Chicago, the author was able to present his paper on the violations of the law of one price. Eugene Fama, a known rationalist, raised questions as to the significance of the examples he presented, such as the closed-end funds discussed in the previous chapter. Fama argued that in these examples, the stakes were not high enough to merit any attention from the community. Fortunately, the author had a witty comeback. He has likened these special cases to fruit flies. According to him, fruit flies are often considered as an irrelevant species in the grand scheme of things. However, the ability of these species to reproduce quickly paved the way for geneticists to study various questions. Similarly, he also associated these examples to be the tip of the iceberg, the iceberg of market pricing. To conclude, the point that the author was trying to drive is this. If the law can be violated at a small level, then there should be greater disparities happening at a bigger level. There is a need to open the eyes of people to these matters because it can greatly affect how they make their decisions, whether economic or not. On a larger scale, if policymakers strongly adhere to the belief that prices are always right, then they would never see clearly enough to come up with proper preventative actions. The Offices In this chapter, the author simply narrated how a new office building caused an uproar among faculty members. It all began when talks of a new office building were being built exclusively for the faculty. Faculty members had the chance to choose their offices, but the problem lies in the order of selection. From the order, they would be able to determine who had the upper hand in the selection process. When the blueprint finally arrives, faculty members seem to be attracted to the same offices. The tension escalated when they found out that the order would be selected based on tenure and not seniority. Things became chaotic. Nevertheless, after they had moved into the new building, they realized that the office rooms that did not seem attractive in the blueprint were not all that bad at all. In fact, some of them either offered easy access to the elevator or had great views of the Chicago skyline. From this, we can see that the problem could have been avoided, or at least mitigated, if the management had foreseen the issues. This situation also reflects how a person's decision-making ability may be greatly affected by external factors. Football An interesting idea came to the author when his work was critiqued by Gary Becker. Becker claims that the models the author used did not involve high stakes and may not be applicable to real-life situations. On the related note, Becker claims that 90% of people cannot do complex analysis of problems, 
so that 10% who can end up with a job. The author's research data, however, reveals that the opposite is true. This led the author to work on a behavioral economics paper based on how players are chosen on the National Football League NFL drafts. The draft offers teams to select prospective players from candidates who currently play for their university's football team. Rationalists will say that these players will be chosen solely on how well they play. The author, however, found several factors which could cause the teams to misbehave, particularly they overvalued their early picks. The author shares the following factors that supported this hypothesis. 1. People are overconfident. As a result, they tend to think that a person's ability is greater than it actually is. 2. Forecasts tend to be too extreme. 3. Teams often bid to attract their players, and those who succeed are the ones who are guilty of overvaluing most. 4. People think that other people share their preferences. 5. People want to win now, thus this creates an illusion that the best players in the draft could instantly turn their losing team into a winning one. Football. An interesting idea came to the author when his work was critiqued by Gary Becker. Becker claims that the models the author used did not involve high stakes and may not be applicable to real-life situations. On the related note, Becker claims that 90% of people cannot do complex analysis of problems so the 10% who can end up with a job. The author's research data, however, reveals that the opposite is true. This led the author to work on a behavioral economics paper based on how players are chosen on the National Football League NFL drafts. The draft offers teams to select prospective players from candidates who currently play for their university's football team. Rationalists will say that these players will be chosen solely on how well they play. The author, however, found several factors which could cause the teams to misbehave, particularly they overvalued their early picks. The author shares the following factors that supported this hypothesis. 1. People are overconfident. As a result, they tend to think that a person's ability is greater than it actually is. 2. Forecasts tend to be too extreme. 3. Teams often bid to attract their players, and those who succeed are the ones who are guilty of overvaluing most. 4. People think that other people share their preferences. 5. People want to win now, thus this creates an illusion that the best players in the draft could instantly turn their losing team into a winning one. Part 8. Game Shows At this point, the author had already conducted enough tests and published enough papers to stay ahead of behavioral economic critics. However, since most of what he studied was based on hypothetical situations, some rationalists dismissed his findings since the stakes were not high enough for the respondents. Unfortunately, no one had the budget to make those choices real. The answer arrived when he was at a trip to the Netherlands where he met Theory Post, Martin van der Assem, and Guido van Tussen, who studied the decisions made by contestants on a Dutch game show. With this, he can finally get data from people who needed to face decisions involving hundreds of thousands of dollars real high stakes. The show involved a number of briefcases, each containing an amount ranging from a few cents to a million euros. Contestants would choose one briefcase that had to be opened at the end of the show. He would then open each case one by one in order to determine if he had picked a winning suitcase or not. Through the course of this suitcase opening, a banker would offer an amount based on the remaining unopened suitcases, and the contestant would answer with a deal or no deal. The author was lucky enough to observe both unlucky and lucky contestants. He noted that those who were unlucky tried to gamble little by little in the hope of breaking even. On the other hand, those who were lucky gambled even more, thinking that it was a house money after all. Indeed, these findings were similar to results in his previous studies. It led him to conclude that regardless of the amount of stake, people would behave the same way when faced with similar situations. Save more tomorrow. By this time, behavioral economics was slowly becoming accepted by the public. Grateful for finally being recognized after years' hard work, behavioral economists devoted their time to help people save for their retirement. Through studies based on self-control problems, they tried to design and offer better savings programs. One such program, conceptualized by the author, was dubbed as Save More Tomorrow. 
The proposal offered people the option to decide now to increase their saving rates that will occur later. Rates would often begin from a 3.5%, which gradually increased to 13.6% after four pay raises. The author suggests that such a gradual increase in savings rates would not only be a great way to prevent loss aversion, but would also prevent the effects of inertia to hold the person back. To the author, his plan was economically sound. What he was not able to foresee were the company's reactions. They did not seem to bite into the idea and were concerned if such scheme had legal implications. Fortunately, the concept was approved by the government in 1998. With its approval, the author was able to test and compare the results of his proposal with another savings plan that was recommended by a consultant. The consultant suggested an increase of 5% for each pay raise, slightly higher than the author's proposal. After three and a half years, those who adopted the Save More Tomorrow plan quadrupled their savings rates, while those who listened to the consultant fell behind after they felt like they were not taking home enough cash for their daily needs. To conclude, the author was confident about his proposal. In fact, he predicts that some kind of automatic escalation plan would be adopted by millions of employees all over the globe in the years to come. Going Public Convinced that behavioral economics can help people in a myriad of ways, the author decided to have a book published. He decided to have the book called Nudge. The premise of the book was based on that humans make predictable errors, and if we can anticipate these errors, then we can greatly reduce the rate by which these errors occur. This may be in the form of established policies or other similar means. In this book, the author laid down the principles of behavioral economics and how it can affect a person's decision-making abilities. Of course, these would be backed by data derived from the various studies he conducted. More importantly, the author was thankful that he spent a great deal of time before settling down with the terminologies he used in the book. Unknown to him at that time, his book will eventually be picked up by prominent personalities and leaders in various fields. Nudging in the UK In one of his trips to London, the author was invited to talk about his book, Nudge. At that time, only a limited number of copies of the book was in circulation, so did not expect a crowd of prominent people. However, one meeting led to another, and he eventually found himself seated next to Sir Gus O'Donnell, then Cabinet Secretary in the United Kingdom. Through these meetings with prominent politicians in the United Kingdom, he was able to help them establish a Behavioral Insights Team, BIT, which was responsible for achieving an insight in major areas of policy, spreading an understanding of behavioral approaches in a government setting, and achieving a return on the cost of running the BIT. While consulting with the BIT, the author eventually came up with the following mantras. 1. That if you want to encourage someone to do something, then you should at least make it easy for that person. According to the author, this step helped people to unfreeze or remove barriers which prevented them from changing or improving. And, two, that we cannot do evidence-based policy if we do not have any evidence to begin with. With these mantras in mind, the BIT was properly guided when it comes to policy making, which usually involves the on-time collection of taxes. As of date, BIT has grown to around 50 team members and has been in charge of supporting public offices across the UK as well as other national governments. This book provides readers with a narration of how the author toiled to prove the existence of behavioral economics. It all began with a realization that traditional economic models do not consider human behavior in coming up with these predictions. As a result, these economic models tend to produce inaccurate predictions. Nonetheless, the author was hesitant about this idea at first. Being educated as an economist, He did not know how much psychology and the workings of human behavior. So before he went to preach his idea to the world, he made sure that it was properly supported by facts and other relevant data. He prepared by making a list of behaviors which he thinks ran counter to the traditional economic theory. He would evaluate each of these situations carefully, and then he would look for possible solutions or explanations to these seemingly peculiar behaviors. This research led him to two known psychologists, Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Eventually, the author had sufficient basis to explain each of the anomalies on his list with the help of Kahneman and Tversky's work. 
However, this was met with much criticism from traditional thinkers since his work was merely based on survey answers based on hypothetical situations. Fortunately, these criticisms did not stop the author from proving his point. Eventually, he was invited to work on several projects that involved real subjects, whose behaviors and decisions he could use to bolster his research. Again, this was heavily criticized. This time, traditional thinkers claim that the stakes were not high enough in order to yield accurate results. Unfazed, the author kept on going with his research. Another door opened for the author, and this time the stakes were high. He was able to observe how people's decisions were affected by overvaluing something or by the effects of winning or losing at gambling. Fortunately, this was enough to convince the skeptics, and the rest is history. As of now, behavioral economics is widely used all over the world. It does not only help investors, but it can greatly help in policy-making activities of businesses and top-level government officials. The author believes that his work can benefit a variety of individuals in trying to understand how things work. For the consumer, it can help him avoid rip-offs and recognize that you do not have to give in to every good deal you encounter. For business owners, this book can serve as a guide for you to understand the mind of your potential clients. Once you see that, you can conjure various deals to help drive sales. In fact, the author's work has helped the top management at Greek Peak Resort to get rid of debts and stay afloat. Finally, the author wishes that this book would help you in your study of economics and psychology, and if you are a skeptic, hopefully this book will help you change your mind.